in soccer in general. England had won the World Cup and had come on and they were still right in it in, in Mexico, the following World Cup. Holland was coming on, Germany was unbelievable at the time, Portugal had some great players. And, all these guys, the biggest guys, always end up coming here. So it was a great time for the game, quite honestly. I came in 65. Uh, there was almost no soccer at all, and the soccer that was played was very ethnic. Uh, we had the Scots club and the German club and two Italian clubs and, you know, uh, the Jewish club, Hakor. But it was very, there was very few Americans playing the game. San Francisco was big, and there was a city called Oakland that wasn't quite as big. San Jose, honestly, was a bit unheard of. A lot of people have trouble with that, but that's a fact. But it was all changing, and uh, Milan, when he came here, fell in love with San Jose, he fell in love with Saratoga, where he lived, and, and um, he started a business. And business was all moving south. Lockheed continued to grow, and people like uh, Hewlett Packard and Apple, and uh, it was just all happening. It was all happening in San Jose, or certainly south. So it was a great business decision. Milan was just eager to get into soccer. He'd played a lot of it in his town over in uh, Yugoslavia. He was just very willing to put up whatever amount of money you, you need. You know, in those days, I, I'm only guessing it might have been three, four hundred thousand. It's not like it is today. But uh, uh, he, he was the most supportive owner that I've ever been around. We were sitting around thinking about, okay, this is so exciting. We've got lots of support going. It looks like we're going to be uh, possible to really get pro soccer started in San Jose. was sort of saying, well, what are we going to do? We need, we need a name, though. We can't just keep calling a team in San Jose. We had a contest to name the team. And so um, he said, you know, we, we took all kinds of stuff. And, you know, whether they actually had a deal from a person or they just made it up and had a contest, I don't know, because Dick was so brilliant with just doing stuff. The Mercury did have a contest, in all fairness. And, and some of the, the names were very traditional. You know, tires and lions and it was all, there was nothing really especially that jumped out. The name Earthquakes was in there, actually. But when Dick saw it, he fell in love with it. But Dick's philosophy was very simple. He says, everybody will hate it. The Mercury hates it, everybody hates it. But it'll get press right away. And we'll be the quakes before anybody knows what's happening. And we gave it to the league, and the league says, no, you can't use that name. And Dick said to the guy, what do you mean we can't use that name? He said, if we want to call ourselves earthquakes, if we want to call ourselves the river rats, it's our team, we can call ourselves whatever we want. And the league came back and they said, no, Dick, you don't understand. He said, we love the name Earthquakes. He said, we don't like the name San Jose. And the biggest guy in the league was Lamar Hunt, who um, obviously owned the Kansas City Chiefs and the Hunt family. It was a great family. And I have a lot of respect for Lamar. He did a tremendous job for soccer. But it was a shock to Lamar and it was a shock to people like Joe Robbie, who owned the Miami Dolphins. These people had... It, they had never really heard of San Jose, and so for them it was a shock. Because the league thought that we would, no matter what, use the name San Francisco. And they said, no, we're going to use the name San Jose. And that was just mayhem. We almost lost the franchise like a week before the, uh, the place opened because they wanted to have San Jose earthquakes. Dick Berg was smart enough to know we needed that local hometown identity. And the rest of the league wanted it to be the San Francisco Bay earthquakes. Stupidest people I ever heard of. But it was brilliant because all the people lived down in the South Bay. There was all kinds of businesses down here in the South Bay. There was a million kids playing soccer down here in the South Bay. So why would you call it San Francisco? Dick st he stood by his guns and Milan stood by his guns and thank God they did. And so now we got, that's how it became the earthquakes. Uh, there were people who thought that we were out of line, but we've, uh, they've come to know that we were out of line a lot of times. <laughs> the club uh, was announced and um, the, the general manager was announced, his name was Dick Berg, great fella, and he hired me on the very first day. And he and I started the club at the Hyatt Hotel on First Street in, I think it was room 
105 or something. We went in and we took two beds out and put two desks in, and that was the start of the club. The dream of Earthquakes owner Milan Mandrick became a reality in early April when 25 players reported to Spartan Stadium for the initial practice sessions under head coach Ivan Toplak. Because of Mandrick's love for the sport of soccer and his enthusiasm for the city of San Jose, the Earthquakes became an exciting addition to the North American Soccer League. He put a bunch together, together with the guys from the San Jose State, uh, local guys, you know, that love soccer and, and, and uh, start playing together, getting together after the games, and they were becoming a little family. I was working at the time, I was teaching school, and uh, a, I received a call from the general manager, and first I thought it was a joke, but then I, you know, talking to Johnny and some of the other guys that I, I hang around with, uh, it was a fact that, you know, the team was here and, uh, and they were interested. So I went to a meeting and obviously from then on, things developed. I was 21 years old, you know, and it was like, you never really know where you're going to go. We had a lot of different guys, uh, myself, you know, coming in from uh, England, you know, to San Jose, California. I'd been in the States a couple of years before in Atlanta. Didn't really, you know, know what to expect and, and how was it going to go. And as I say, you know, the first two years for me was like, the team folded, it moved, and I got put into a draft, which I didn't understand. And I was in England at the time, and it was like, do I want to go back and go to that? Because it's not like any other country, you know, where the, the teams are there from, you know, 1800s. I was in Atlanta, the team folded. They had the expansion draft in San Jose, it was a team, and from what I understand, I'd played against some of the guys, Gabo and Mirko, and uh, some of the other guys that were out here for Oakland Clippers. And um, I think Julie Menendez was the coach at San Jose State, and he was involved with the draft for the team, and he talked them into drafting me out here. My first meeting was, um, he interviewed me for the trainer's job, and uh, I was very frank and honest with him, and said, Johnny, I don't know much about the game of soccer, and in his typical Scottish accent, an injury is an injury, and uh, whether it be football, baseball, basketball, soccer is much the same. It's, it's a body part that you can help us repair. After several interviews, uh, I decided to go uh, with the San Jose Earthquakes. And at that time, it was developing. And I think there was maybe less pressure. I'm not sure if there's less pressure, but the camaraderie was a big thing. And all the people coming in here had the same goal, to make the club successful. Whether it was winning, whether it was off the field to bring in the fans, everybody played their part for that. For us, that we were local. The local players were extremely excited because we have gone through all the levels. We play youth, we play semi-pro, we play college. Some of us were in the Olympic team. Uh, there was just nowhere to go but either leave the area and try to go play somewhere else or, uh, or keep on working. Most of us had jobs at the time. Uh, there's no way we were going to gamble and go somewhere where we, we didn't know we were going to succeed or not. So um, it was difficult to, uh, to give up your job and just say, hey, I'm going to play soccer. When I started in 1974, this club was blue collar because players didn't live on their, this salary from the earthquakes alone. Davy Kemp had a job, you know. Paul Childs did things while he was here. The Demling brothers had jobs. Manny taught at presentation back then. Every guy had to have another job to make it work. So when they came to work here, it was truly blue collar. It was a hammer and nail, get the belt on and go to work, you know. I respect those because here's a guy that would be working eight hours a day and be at Spartan Stadium at 6.30, 7 o'clock for a two and a half hour practice. I sold insurance when I was in Atlanta while I was playing. And I came out here, the radio station was gonna broadcast our games and so I went in and sold time for the games. From day one, guys stuck together as a group and they fought together as a group. We were close on the field and off the field. Off the field, we did things together. 
always trying to involve everybody in, in it. We would go to practice, and after we would go to practice, somebody would say, let's go over the prune yard, over the garret, we'll have a beer or something. You know, well, I didn't really drink that much, but I was one of those guys, I just look at, I'm a rookie, I'm, you know, somebody asked me to go, I'm there. So we ended up going to the garret a lot of times, and, and, and I would literally be losing five pounds a day at a workout. I mean, the weather was great here. We have a hard workout. I lose a lot of weight. And then these guys wanted to go out and drink beer. I just, I found that wild, but I was wanted to be one of the guys, so I went with the team. And that's the way we played. Um, we fought for each other. If a guy is down, the rest of the guys pick him up and kept him going. I think the guys started that way. We fought that way. And to give you a feel of it, we had a situation 75, we signed a player, we'll mention his name, but the, we went out to train and it was a really hard session and he was moaning because the session was too hard. And uh, that wasn't us, man. That, that, that was like completely foreign. You know, it was like, talking about, uh, he learned. We knew we could play. It was a, a chance to prove ourselves. We have gone through the college ranks, through the semi-pro, through the youth. So to play professional was a chance for all of us to say, hey, Let's show these people what we can do. So we work really hard. I mean, that team, those, the team in those days, it was hard work. We believe in that. You got to give the crowd what they came, to, what they pay for. So it was, it was an attitude. It was a psychological uh, stage in our in our life where uh, you know we would die on the field for for the earthquakes. For me, I was a young guy coming out of college and. I loved playing soccer, and so for me, every day we had practice, sometimes twice a day, and I, I couldn't wait to get to the practice field to get to be with the guys. Whenever you play on a, on a sports team that's team-oriented, it's always a bonding thing. I just think it was a close-knit group for whatever reason from the get-go. We didn't have any what I would call quote-unquote stars. We had a bunch of guys that just came together and I think we were pretty successful just because of the bonding that we have. So when you, you play with guys like Gobble and, and uh, Mirko Stojanovic, you have Ivan Toplak who's a, a World Cup class coach who's, who's you know involved with our club, uh, you, you really learn a lot. We brought in a coach at that time by the name of Ivan Toplak. Top black was Yugoslavian, excellent coach, world-class coach, and but he unfortunately had uh, duty on the uh, national team for Yugoslavia, so he had to go back with the result that Gabo took over the coaching. Gabo, if you'd done a good job for him and really tried hard, uh, he would support you, but he he was just, he didn't believe in injuries. I mean, I've seen him, actually seen him run into a wall at Spartan Stadium when he was playing, because the first year he actually played as well as a player coach. And uh, he actually run into the wall at Spartan Stadium, and I think the wall came off the worst. You know, he was just as hard a player as I've ever seen. And that, and that rolled over into his coaching style. We had a guy called Laurie Calloway who was with Wolves in England. There was a lot of good clubs and Laurie come over and the very first training session uh, we were at St. Patrick's College uh, and he went over on his ankle in a hole and, and uh, it was very bad. And we had a game three days later and he was ready for the game. He, you know, he taught us all, you got to be ready. I mean, this is showtime. This is, there ain't no hiding here. And efforts have led to this historic date, and in a matter of minutes, we will be ready for the kickoff and a look at this new era in professional sports for San Jose. Quite true. As we look across the stadium today, through a rather heavy downpour, I might add, there certainly is a sizable crowd on the far side of the field. Down on the field itself, we had played exhibition games and we had done a lot, but I can still remember going to Empire Stadium Sunday afternoon. Packed house. And for most of us, I would say, with the exception of a few players who had played a long time, it was so exciting. This was actually a reality. This is what we trained for. This is what we were coming to do. We were out of the city. We, were, we traveled together. Uh, some of us were starting to get to know each other. Uh, there were players from other countries, other places. So, so for us, it was very exciting. Uh, Vancouver, their people got behind their team too. So. So it was a great atmosphere. Guys were on a cloud. A lot of guys were nervous. 
but we had enough experienced guys in the team. I had guys like Gabo and Mirko. We had about eight guys who were solid experienced pros and so we, we calmed down the rookies and get them in, in gear and get them rolling. Oh, it was the very first game of the season for us on the road and for Vancouver. They packed the place. It was great. My very first pro game, it was, a, it was a wet game so you could slide on the AstroTurf and I slid into a guy, the guy gave me a yellow card, my first tackle. I scored, a, I scored a goal against him in Vancouver. That was pretty pretty tough. Buzz Demlin got the ball on the, he was playing right fullback and he, he moved a little bit towards the midfield with the ball and he, he saw me on the left wing and he just kicked the ball across the field. And I was gonna trap it, but the fullback was coming really fast and I said, if I trap it, he's probably gonna nail me. So I just let it rip and he hit me. So I went down, I never saw the ball go in. Uh, it was a full volley from far away. So it was one of those things that most of the time they go to the moon, but that one went in. And, it was <laughs> and that was so, so the next thing I knew I was underneath the pile. Ended up uh, fighting back, tying the game, and they went into, it went into overtime, then went into shootout. You used to take five kicks, five penalty kicks, five penalty kicks. If it was tied, then you would go sudden death till somebody missed. My turn to take a penalty and the crowd started booing as soon as I walked up. And I, I kind of started to taunt them and I turned around, put both hands in the air and waved to them. <laughs> and then I went up <laughs> and hit it and missed it. <laughs> it got down to the tenth kicker. And all the time, I'm, they didn't pick me, they didn't pick me, I'm sweating bullets. The goalkeeper, Miracle, had played unbelievable. He had stopped three or four shots. and So I'm worried now it comes down to number 10 and I figured, well, it's gonna be me. Well, the coach comes up and he goes over to Mirko and says, Mirko, are you ready to take the kick? And I kinda, kinda went first, I thought, you're not picking me? And then at the same moment, I thought, he didn't pick me. Mirko says, no, no, no. He says, I, I'm hot, I can't do it. You know, boom, 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 I'm not ready unless I have to, you know. And he, so then Gobble would come over to me and he goes, Mark, you're my man. And I go, I'm your man. I do, you know, what, what else are you gonna do? I mean, is this a confidence builder? You go to the goalkeeper first and then you don't pick me? So I ended up taking the penalty. I hit it as hard as I could. I hit it to the keeper's right, it went in. And now Vancouver's gotta come to keep it going. Brian Budd, unbelievable athlete. He wolfs it over the top. We win the game. It was our first victory away on the on the on the rainy day on the penalty kicks overtime. Uh, uh, funny thing was after the game was over, we were rushing to the to the dressing room and suddenly said, "Don't go to showers. Get pick up the stuff." With the extended time it took to to play the game, we ended up in the locker room, and the next thing you know, Dirk Berg, our general manager at that time, ran in and said, "We have ten minutes to get out of this locker room." There's going to be an airline strike, and we need to get on the plane ASAP. It didn't matter what stage of dress you were in, you had to leave. We didn't even take a shower. I mean, there were guys running their underwear through the crowd because we had to get to the bus. The bus was leaving. I can still remember Dick Bird getting out a $20 bill and handing it to the bus driver and said, we need to get to the airport in 15 minutes. And thank God we got there, got on the airline. Nobody would sit near us on the plane because it didn't smell too good, but uh, it was just an unbelievable experience. And you put it all together. We never even had time to sit down and enjoy it. I mean, we we're carrying half our clothes with us as we were running out the door. And um, it was only on the plane home that it really sank in. This is what we've done. This is, this is incredible. We had, I think it's fair to say, maybe two or three months to try to build the club and, and uh, it was my job to try to get the players as they came aboard in the schools and, and, and in the shopping centers and basically anywhere that people would let us in the door. Dick Berg took me to um, LA to the set of Earthquake. I met Charlton Heston, uh, George Kennedy. And I was dribbling the ball through all the, the you know, the uh, destruction, and uh, and it was like, 
surreal, you know. It's like, is this really happening? You know, is this this what's going on? And 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 people saw that kind of thing in Sports Illustrated, jump onto it, you know. And it's just crazy how that uh, it just took off, like uh, like you know, you wouldn't believe. With the 49ers, I I learned that person-to-person -person marketing outdoes newspaper advertising, you know, 50 to one, maybe a thousand to one. If you can get a player face-to-face -face with a kid, he is gonna remember your name and he'll talk about it at home and on and on and on. When they hired me, the, the concept was to try to get the kids in and try to take that you know, we'd work with coaches and, and, and we helped build the game. Not me, I mean, all of the guys did. It was, uh, the guys really put their shoulder to the wheel. We visited many high schools. We played basketball against their faculty and then we played soccer with half and half the game. One of the challenges was, was you just had to constantly sell the game. And that's what we were doing. We used to go to Eastridge Shopping Center. They had a three-tier foyer uh, or, or whatever you want to call it in the middle of the mall. And then we used to have the, the cheerleaders, which were called shakers at the time, and they would always have two or three of the girls with us. They would always have these real cute red outfits on with white go-go boots and short skirts, and they would have all this information about season tickets and the next game and all kinds of stuff that they would be passing around as we would stay in the middle of this three-story thing and we would just juggle the soccer ball. So we would get four or five guys and we would juggle the ball for a half hour at a shopping center while the girls passed out all kinds of information. We were always meeting people and people came out to the game because we were accessible to them. The first thing they did when players came in was have them sign into that. And, and the players signed on to it and, and they went out and they did it week in and week out, day in and day out. And so you'd go from one shopping center to the other, then from all the radio stations. And again, if you, that was what you needed to do to sell the game. As I went on and played in different places, that was, you know, I was kind of like spreading that word too, that we have to get out in the community and the community have to realize that, you know, we're regular people too. We're not superstars or special people. There was a great sports writer by the name of uh, Tex Mall for Sports Illustrated. And Tex Mall came to San Jose to see what all the noise was about. He actually interviewed five families. And all five families had met a player before they saw their first game. We just, you know, uh, are lucky enough to play a game what we get paid for. And you're a big part of us getting paid for it. And, uh, you know, we've got to get out there. and. And, and let those people people know. By the time the first game came around, there was a buzz. And when you ran out, you were playing for somebody. I mean, the noise was there. You know, we're feeling it together. When you're having a bad game and people let you know you're having a bad game, man, you know, you gotta dig in a bit. Everybody that came here, the big players from all over the world, when they came to play in San Jose, it was like playing in Europe, it was playing in Brazil. It was noise, it was right on top of you. It was big time. Yeah, it was fabulous. It all began on May 11 against Kyle Rudd Jr. and the Dallas Tornado. Old, antiquated Spartan Stadium was alive with excitement and anticipation. 15,678 people were on hand to kick off the season. Most were in their seats early for the opening night pregame festivities that included the Shakers. Besides being an attractive addition on game night, the girls were an integral part of the earthquake's people-to-people -people promotional effort. The highlight of the opening night pregame festivities occurred when Milan Mandrik warmly welcomed the historic first night throng, saying he hoped that all visiting teams would be sorry they found their way to San Jose. The sports world was shocked as the walls of Spartan Stadium shook with the ever-increasing crowds that grew to more than 20,000 people. Milan's prophecy came true. Crazy George, the Quakes instigator delivered the opening game ball in his now nationally renowned and unique style. The first game ever for the Earthquakes, it was just like being at Camelot, I guarantee. It was such a special feeling for the community at large, for the Earthquake players, and for me. You can't put in words the excitement. It gave the town an identity they never had before. And the Quakes gave them that major league image, and it was just super.
At first, it, it, it was 16,000 people. They had to delay the game 45 minutes because they weren't ready for the crowd. They were probably expecting six, 8,000, you know. They promoted it, but they had no idea. And all at once, there was 100 people deep in each booth trying to buy tickets, and nobody could get in. So they just they had to delay the game. And for 45 minutes, they sold tickets and sold tickets. And pretty soon, they finally started the game and had all 15,000 people in. And of course, with a, no team ever drawing over 8,000 a game. And here now, we're the new team in the league, and we put 15,000 in the seats. Unheard of. Similar to the, the Vancouver game, the people in that small stadium, the cheering, and the fact that, you know, you've spent the past, I don't know, six months probably, bringing in players, eliminating players, coming down to your final squad. The fact that you are now one of the 18 players that was on the roster, I think was a was really a big thing. And especially for us, for the guys who lived here. Uh, it's different for somebody coming in, say from England or Yugoslavia, you know, ex-professionals, they've been there, done that, they've been through it all before. But for people like Johnny, you know, Manny Hernandez, myself, uh, this is our town. We lived here. We know everybody here. And, and there's no way in the world where we're going to let them down. And to walk down there, walk down that ramp and see that stadium jammed full with avid fans was heartwarming. The crowd was enthusiastic, players, you know, Paul, that's the beginning with Paul Child, and uh, it was modest but very good beginning. Obviously, you're as nervous as you could be. Um, you got butterflies, and you, you do every game, it was the same way, but once you got onto that field, all your goal was to, for me, was to score a goal and just to come away with a victory for the, for the fans, just as much as for the team, you know, and send everybody home happy. The fans quickly took to the Earthquake's exciting brand of soccer as San Jose exploded for a 4-3 win over Dallas. For the 15,000 opening night fans, it had all just begun. Crazy George, fireworks, and for thousands of San Jose kids, an autograph from America's newest sports hero, Hal Roach, Jr. The Earthquakes were the first major league sports franchise to identify with San Jose, and the people of San Jose were quick to reinforce Mandrick's belief that San Jose will one day become the sports center of the Bay Area. It was still a growing city. And so I think when I came out here, half of this wasn't here. All around the airport was farmland. And I just loved the city. I liked the people. People were friendly. It was easy to get around. It would be difficult for people to to imagine what it is to be playing all your life and then all of a sudden say, hey, I have an opportunity to play professional. And in the city where I live, you know, it was, <laughs> that's an unbelievable feeling. For us, it was just to set an example for the kids. You know, I mean, we didn't want to go on the field and come out losers. Maybe that relationship with the people, the kids, uh, it really affected us on the field because we put an extra effort always. Uh, the money, it wasn't a, an issue with us. You know, it was just, it was a show. And it was, a, and it was fun. You know, it just, it was fun to be together. I think when you've got that togetherness, it's you against the rest of the world. And in all fairness, San Jose again, being a small city, you know, fighting for that recognition, we, we kind of bought into that too. You know, hey, we we're going to show New York who we were. We we're going to show Chicago. You know, we, we weren't going to back down to anybody. It didn't matter how big they were. And there was big names came. But we were the San Jose Earthquakes. Maybe it's that small city mentality. Maybe it's us against the world. But we fought the league. We fought the commissioner back then. We fought, you know, it was just the way it was. We, we took a bit of pride in it. Uh, the Sharks came later. There's other... Uh, there's a lot of other things that are happening in the city. But the Quakes, we talk about Quakes in soccer, is San Jose. And that is, it goes hand in hand. San Jose Earthquake. There's no way you can change that. Uh, you can give it another name, you can do whatever you want, but it goes hand in hand. It's just, we represent the city. And the city took us under their umbrella, and uh, they were great to us. San Jose was always a great atmosphere. The people showed up. 
um, overflowing crowds and they were into the game. We as a team reacted to to the to the crowd and and they push us sometimes and get us over the hump and and so it, it was fun playing in front of that kind of crowd they were enthusiastic they hung around after the game just to meet you and get an autograph and hang out and talk with you the quakes fans rapidly became educated to the world's most popular game they also found that soccer wasn't for the weak at heart it had its bruising moments when we started playing, you never really knew, you know, how many people were going to turn up. Did they appreciate the game? And uh, it just took off like a wildfire. I mean, people coming out of the woodwork to watch us play, 19,000 people at San Jose State. And, uh, and for every game, we just touched the core, I think. It, it just seemed like they wanted to support the San Jose Earthquakes, like we wanted to go out and support the, the fans. And uh, I think that's what really kind of made that uh, connection. I think a big part of it was uh, because the players were out and, and the fans thought they were a, a part of the team. We'd show up at games and the people were outside tailgating and we'd go out and hang out with them for a while before we go into the locker room. And so that was a big part of it. People came out and tailgate because they know they were going to meet some of the players. By then, now people knew the game and our fans became very sophisticated. They knew great play. They knew mistakes and uh, they appreciated that. I think that opened my eyes to the knowledge that was going on in the Silicon Valley with the game of soccer. I can't really remember what our record was, but I know it was. It, it had an impact on the fans because obviously everything we did, every promotion we did, there was there was people there, you know, just wanting to meet the Johnny Moores of the world, David Camp, you know, Manny Hernandez, you know, Paul Child, and Laurie Calloway, and all these guys that just uh, they just wanted to know us, and uh, we wanted to know them. And I think it, that's kind of the chemistry. It's kind of like a, having a good team together. The chemistry of that team was fantastic. You know, the Mark Damlins and Buzz Damlins and, and, and these guys that just had a great rapport with the people. And that was the whole thing. Just get the people to the game. If you got the people to the game, they came back. I mean, everybody got kind of caught up in the atmosphere. It wasn't very expensive to come to the games. They had a family plan. You could get a family plan of four, I don't know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks. I mean, it was, it was incredible. You couldn't go to a baseball game. You couldn't go to a football game, take your kids. It was just too expensive. The people came out and just let loose and had fun. At first, I'm sure some of them weren't sure what it was all about, but just the atmosphere had people come in and they wanted to see what was going on. And I remember um, some of the 49er players would come out to games and they said they came out just to see what it was all about because they'd never seen soccer. And they were wondering why is it we're drawing all the crowds we're drawing down here. And they were playing up in Candlestick and you know, they weren't getting that kind of enthusiastic crowd and we were doing it down here. All of a sudden we were famous, you know, in the city in which we're, you know, we were playing amateur ball. So, so it was, it was very, uh, quite a change. Fans came early to see the arrival of Crazy George who led the crowd to rocking chants spurring the quakes on. George is a unique phenomenon in the world of sports. He is a high school electronics teacher. He holds a black belt in judo, and he has become nationally known for his ability to instigate incredible response with a mere wave of his hand. Well, it's a, it's a long story, but Dick Berg was the general manager, and he saw me a few years before, and he, and he saw that I got 3,000 people out cheering the 50,000 Stanford fans when I was leading San Jose State never forgot it. He was used to be up in San Francisco with the 49ers and he'd have famous stars come in and do the national anthem and stuff. Well, nobody would come down here. So he thought, what could we do to bring George in to maybe start, start a precedent of delivering the game ball? He approached me 
and offered me to, to do the season for him, cheer for him for the earthquake's first season at the grand total of $35 a game. And it was fun. One of the wildest crowds of the year witnessed one of the most spectacular comebacks in U.S. soccer history in a key intradivisional midseason clash. Unfortunately for the Quakes, popular stars Manny Hernandez and Dieter Zeidel were ejected in the second half, leaving the Quakes two men short on the field. Paul Child's goal with four minutes left set the scene for Lalo Perez tally with just seconds remaining. Although San Jose lost in the controversial overtime tiebreaker penalty kick, the fans were treated to one of the most exciting games on record. With six games left in the regular season, some major changes took place. 72-year-old Johnny Downs, longtime Bay Area soccer enthusiast, became San Jose's equipment manager, joining trainer Dave Obenauer, well known as just plain Obi. And head coach Ivan Toplak returned to the team following his duties with the Yugoslav World Cup team. Coach Toplak, recognized as one of the leading soccer coaches in the world, led the Quakes to five wins in six games. Five consecutive victories over Boston, Denver, Toronto, Vancouver, and St. Louis were marred only by a loss to the Washington Diplomats. The season's finale before a record Spartan Stadium standing room only crowd of 20,738 was against eventual NASL champion Los Angeles. At that time, you got six points for a win. You got one point for every goal you scored up to three. So you could get a maximum nine points for any game. We went into the last game of the season. We were playing LA. They're leading the league in, in points at this point. And we're playing them the final game of the season. And we have to beat them. And we have to score three goals. Otherwise, we don't make the playoffs. It was 0-0 at the half, and the Earthquakes' playoff hopes were in serious jeopardy. Paul Child needed at least one goal to win the North American Soccer League scoring title. Not only do we got to beat the best team, we got to beat them by three at 0-0 at half, and we go out in the second half and get five goals. We make the playoffs. Everybody's going crazy. I've got the ball. The clock's ticking down. Everybody's screaming, pass, 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 pass. I can see the clock as it ticks down, five, four, three. I don't wait for the guy to blow the whistle. I pick the ball up, put it underneath my shirt, and I run to the locker room. Stadium announcer Bob Ray and the Earthquake fans saluted Paul and the playoff-bound Quakes. Next year, the North American Soccer League is going into indoor soccer. Indoor soccer is considered one of the fastest growing sports in the world, as witnessed by its popularity in Europe and Russia. Your San Jose Earthquakes are already eagerly looking forward to next season and another shot at the North American Soccer League championship title. For the first time in its nine-year history, the North American Soccer League was going to play an indoor soccer schedule. Soccer fans were obviously intrigued by this fast, condensed version of the world's most popular sport. They jammed the Cow Palace to the rafters to see the Earthquakes win the Western Regional Playoffs. More than 9,000 Quake fans returned for the national semifinal game. And the Earthquakes treated them to an 8-5 conquest over Dallas in that game, while Tampa romped over New York. And that set the stage for the first ever North American Indoor Soccer Championship. The Earthquakes got themselves to an early lead. Again, it was Child, this time with Art Welch. Then it was Robustoff and Moore.
And then the scorer, Paul Child, becomes a passer to Art Welch. The Earthquakes were champions. The fans were ecstatic. And after the game, so was Paul Child. I can't believe it yet, Tom. Um, I know the game's over. We've won it all and everything. And, uh, I'm just so happy you can hear the people here. It's what do you think was the key today? One year earlier, they were but a dream. And now, they were the champions of all North America. The season hadn't come to an end for San Jose fans. Pele and his New York Cosmos played the Earthquakes before yet another standing room only crowd of nearly 20,000, and that on a weeknight. They saw perhaps the best soccer game ever played at Spartan Stadium. In those days, the heavyweight champion of the world was regarded as the biggest athlete in America, and to some degree, huge in the rest of the world, but, but Pele was way beyond that. He was in another planet. Pelé was kind of an idol for me growing up, and it was an honor. I, I had played against him before um, on the All-Star team. We played against Santos. So having him come here was huge. It was huge for the city of San Jose, but it was huge for us as players. I'll be honest with you, just to be on the same field as him. Gabo came to me the morning of the game or the day before, I can't remember. And he said, uh, I'm going to have you mark Pele. And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and he says, no, I'm going to have you mark him because they're going on tour after this game and they don't want him hurt. And he says, you're not going to hack him and kick him around. So, you know, and it, it was a fun, fun game. I enjoyed it. And I, I'll always, I'll never forget it to the day I die, but um, we were, we'd finished the warm-ups, and then we'd come down to be introduced, and they would introduce players one by one. And our crowd was an American crowd, largely an American crowd. And I remember I was standing there thinking, I hope they know who he is, you know, I, I hope they appreciate, you know. And uh, they introduced all of their players, and they introduced him last. And then they, they called out, number 10, ballet. And he bounced out like this, and the place was a stand innovation. It was immediate. I mean, I still, it gives me goosebumps this thing. It was, I remember standing back thinking, now that is something, man, now that is something. San Jose was just preserved. Little time left in the first half, and there's Ilya. Really, the goal belonged to Johnny Moore, who stole it from Pele and got it to Ilya for that first goal. Nobody has to tell number 15 what to do with it after he's got it. In the second half, the game really got wild. New York tied it up. Look at this pass from Pele to Tommy Ord. Just no way to stop it for goalie Mike Ivanow. Perfect pass from Pele. Then Paul Child broke a long dry spell and a perfect pass from Bandoff. came back, trailing 2-1. Liverich into the penalty area, tripped by Davy Kemp. The referee says, penalty kick. Cosmo pick number 10, the Black Pearl. To tie the score. The greatest player in the history of soccer. He scored more than 1,200 goals in his long career, and yet, here he is looking every bit as happy on this goal as perhaps he was on his very first goal. The Quakes dejected momentarily, falling prey to the great Pele. 
with San Jose playing for probably its best game of the year. Coming back just minutes later to put it away. Give me a minute. She's got Vandoff open on the left side. Passes to him. Boris dribbles in toward the penalty area. Now cross in front. He's got more there. Johnny shoots. He scores! The Earthquakes win it 3-2. An amazing victory to close out 1975. It was a year to remember. Exciting games, record-setting attendance for the second straight year. And most of all, it set the stage for 1976, a year when the earthquakes will again make soccer and San Jose both the real thing. I remember you had some people interviewing you through the years and they ask you things and, and they, they, they don't understand how hard it is to get here, you know, how hard it is to become an earthquake. Every guy that comes in was the best guy in his youth team and he was the best guy in his high school and he was the best guy in his college and then he's got to come in, he's got to fight to knock a pro out of the the roster, and then he's got to fight to make the starting lineup. So the guys that come in are all really, really good guys. If you've got a club spirit and you take good guys like that, you've got the makings of a great team, a great organization. My journey as a soccer player was long and has a lot of success, has a few down paths, but coming here, as I said again, it was like coming to the, discovering the new country. I'm very proud that we managed to leave the, something that the, the league and the soccer in this country build on. We left, we left some kind of legacy that helped the, 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 uh, promoting the sport. And it's fantastic to see success that teams are enjoying today. The game of soccer actually facilitated, open a lot of avenues for me. Uh, to succeed in life. Uh, I was able to go to college, I was able to get a teaching job, and I've, you know, in terms of what soccer has done for me, uh, is my experience has been phenomenal. I mean, I met a lot of people, uh, made a lot of good friends, and the memories are unbelievable. As you, as you play and you move on and, and, and either retire and go on to get in a regular job because we, none of us were millionaires, you know what I mean? And uh, you look back and you realize, and you see the game has evolved and, and got a foothold now in, in the country, you know, the game's got a hold. It's never gonna go back. So I think, you know, that's when you realize, boy, we, had, we did have something to do with that. Not just us, but people in Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, you know, the, the teams that were around way back. Just seeing it bloom right now is fantastic. I've put the time in. I've uh, dedicated uh, a large part of my life to, to it. Coming out here and, and building a community of soccer. It's, it's a pleasure to look around and see the kind of crowds they're pulling, drawing now. The amount of people that are playing the game, the amount of kids that are playing the game, and um, look back and say, well, I was a part of that, getting all that started by going out and doing clinics, doing appearances, and getting kids started in the game. Soccer in America can only get bigger. There's no question about it. We're developing homegrown talent. The leagues are strengthening. If you look at the fields on a Saturday morning, they're, they're packed. All the fields are full. All the kids are playing. It's a wonderful game, and we've said this from day one. I'm a pioneer of a great, great thing, a great sport, a great community, a great organization. Today, uh, I'm really proud of what they're doing. It's, it's been a long-standing name in the world of soccer, and a lot of players have come out of here and uh, nothing but pride and uh, everybody here should be very proud of their team and the players who made it. It's not necessarily guys like me, it's those players and they were so special and they still are, I know. I'm sure that, that they would go on a minute's notice to uh, recruit another fan. I run into some people and they're, you know, older people and look and you know, say, hey, Mir, how you doing? We were at your first game. I said, my God, 40 years passed and <laughs> I still meet people that are in their 50s and their 60s and they, and they come and say, hey, I remember when you play and that, that's always very gratifying. I'm just really proud to be part of that, you know, to think that we started it. 
this club changed my life. It gave me some of the greatest friends I'll ever have. It gave me a great amount of pride. I, I, I just can't say enough about this club. It's part of me. It's honestly part of me. I feel it when I walk in the stadium. I feel the fans make me feel part of it. it it's just it's just right. Uh, being an earthquake is something really special.